Welcome everyone. My name is Mathieu Roy and I am assistant professor in the Department of Psychology here at McGill. Uh, and I'm going to be the host for this third event of our mini science series on the brain. We are located on the downtown campus of McGill's University and we are on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabeg nations. Uh, McGill has long recognized and honored these nations as the traditional stewards of the land and waters that we work on and uh, meet on to exchange and learn from each other. To introduce our speakers on this uh, evening are the student ambassadors, Chloe Sarmento and Anouk Arsenault. Hi, I'm Chloe Sarmento and I'll be presenting Professor John. So Brendan T. Johns is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at McGill University, and he is also an associate editor of the journal Behavior Research Methods. He obtained his PhD in 2012 from Indiana University in the Departments of Cognitive Science and Psychological and Brain Sciences. During this talk, Professor Johns will discuss the distinction between big data and classic approaches within cognitive science research and present the power and promise of big data approaches to understanding the mind using computational models of language processing. And I'll pass it on to Anouk. Hello, I'm Anouk Yassano and I'll be presenting Professor Gold. Professor Gold has been studying philosophy for almost 40 years. He has a PhD and two postdocs in the field, one from Australia and one from McGill University. Dr. Gold also completed a master's degree in neuroscience at Princeton University and is particularly interested in the cross-section of neurophilosophy. In this talk, he will discuss the kinds of questions philosophers are asking about neuroscience and then speak to the ways in which neuroscience can contribute to philosophy and philosophy to neuroscience. I'll uh, now hand it over to Professor Johns. Want to see, see that? Is it good? Okay, perfect. All right, thanks everybody for uh, looks really bright uh, for uh, uh, inviting me for this to to this. So I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology here at, at McGill University. Um, I run the McGill Cognitive Computing Laboratory, um, and so my research, as you might have guessed from that uh, great introduction, focuses on machine learning and big data approaches to uh, cognitive science. And so the, so I have a newborn child. So I have a son who is four months old. His name is Tristan. Um, he, although he's a very gifted four, four month old, uh, he still has a lot to learn, right? So as human beings, we are, no matter at what point in life that we are at, we have an immense amount of information to acquire, right? For us to be functional beings, to, to interact, appropriately in our environment to communicate effectively, to have jobs, to go to school. There is just a massive amount of information that we need to retain and a massive amount of information that we need to, to harness to actually accomplish those things. Um, and so this is a, this has been a problem that has sort of stymied and, and interested um, philosophers and, and scientists for millennia. So you can go back to, in Western philosophy, go back to Plato and Aristotle, um, which this was a major um, discussion point. So there's an entire field of philosophy called epistemology designed around the, the study of, of knowledge and, and, it's, and, and how it's done and how it's represented. And so given that I am giving a talk with one of the foremost philosophers of the mind in Canada, um, I put together a talk that uh, is my most phil philosophical, as you could say. Um, I almost failed my undergraduate philosophy of mind course, so so Ian will have to, to give me a grade on this when I'm done. Um, but so so the the reason why people have been really interested in this is that if you look at the types of information, the types of knowledge that say a typical undergraduate has acquired, it is an immense amount of information, right? They've, they've read 
X number of books, they've interacted in X number of situations and they can be completely functional or mostly functional um, uh, adults. And so various theorists across sort of the ages have, have theorized about how this is possible. Um, so, so Plato had his own ideas about sort of what we would call innate knowledge, um, but this is best sort of encompassed by uh, Noam Chomsky, who is the father of um, linguistics, and he was a major figure in the development of cognitive science and cognitive psychology um, through some of his criticisms of behaviorism at the time. So at the time, Chomsky, uh, when he was a young researcher, behaviorism was the, the dominant approach in psychology, and behaviorism was completely devoted to uh, understanding the relationship between the inputs that people receive from the environment and how that's related to, to the types of behaviors that people have. Uh, and according to behaviorist theory, um, there couldn't be any middle room. So they completely ignored sort of the stuff that's in the mind and they were just interested in this, this input output machine. Uh, and Chomsky famously had a, a couple papers early in the 1950s uh, criticizing one of the major behaviorists at the time, B.F. Skinner. And through that, that research, Chomsky proposed this sort of all-encompassing theory of, of language processing, proposing essentially that much of our ability to use language was based in what he called an innate language module. That is, there is a part of our brain that's completely sort of dedicated to the human ability to process language, and every single human being has this same module. Um, and this was, this was very coherent with lots of theories that were emerging in computer science at the time. Um, it was coherent with a lot of the things that were going on in the development of computer programming languages, for example. Um, and so the, it, when we boil these, these approaches down, what both Plato and Chomsky proposed was that in order for people to actually behave as intelligently as they can, as we can see people behave um, every day, there needed to be some sort of innate component to their, to their mind, right? There needed to be some genetically encoded um, information that allowed people to actually acquire as much knowledge as, as they are seemingly capable to do. And so this was, um, this prompted Chomsky to make an argument uh, that, that doesn't receive too much attention today, but was, was very well studied um, through the 60s and, and 70s. And, and it's what he called the poverty of the stimulus. And so what he referred to as the poverty of the stimulus was that he thought that the information that we actually get in our everyday lives are um, such that they're too noisy, they're too incomplete, um, to, such that we can't, we can't actually acquire all the knowledge that we need to do from directly from experience. So this goes back to sort of the behaviorist approach, right? So if behaviors propose that all of behavior comes from environmental inputs, um, Chomsky is saying that that cannot be the case, that, that uh, on the face of it is, is impossible because of this impoverished input that human beings receive. And so this was a, a fairly well accepted sort of proposal for, for a long time. And it's one that is extremely hard to argue against, right? Like um, if, if you think about environmental inputs, how do we actually go about quantifying this stuff, right? How, do, how can we understand, um, you know, the input that my son is receiving on an everyday basis? It's virtually impossible um, with the exception that these days we have a fairly incredible ability to start to collect data. And this, this data collection that has been happening for about the last 25 years in the computational sciences has been changing cognitive science for not, not quite as long as, as what's been happening in computer science, but there is definitely a, a major changes going on because we can start to understand what the structure of the environment that people are exposed to are, right? So, um, instead of just making all of these assumptions about what our environmental inputs are, we can actually have a recording of our environment, right? We have cameras, we have microphones, we have all these things that we can actually start to look at and understand the things that say children and adults get, um, get, in, in, get exposed to during their, their lifespan. 
Uh, and so this is a very old goal in the cognitive sciences. So there's a, a paper or a book, uh, sorry, by Herbert Simon in 1969 uh, entitled The Sciences of the Artificial. Herbert Simon was, is one of the fathers of modern cognitive science and artificial intelligence research. Um, he uh, is one of the few psychologists who has ever won the Nobel Prize. And so in, in this book, which is, is excellent, he has this um, example of, of a, a researcher trying to understand the behavior of an ant. And so he said, if you just look at the path that an ant is taking along a beach, it seems like the ant is doing something complicated, right? So if you just look at this, this map and you see where the ant is going, it looks like they, and it, it's very easy to ascribe some sort of sophisticated mechanism by which they are going through their environment. But when you actually look at that ant's behavior in relation to the environment that, that it's in, it becomes much simpler to understand how it's behaving and why it's behaving. Um, and so uh, this sort of demonstrates that if we want to understand the behavior and why people behave as they do, we also need this understanding of, of the environment in which they are interacting with. Uh, and so in my own area of research, which is, is language and, and memory, there's been major movements in, in being able to quantify the information sources that people are, are exposed to and to understand how that exposure maps on to the behaviors that people have in, in language and memory. And so particularly what the, the major change that has happened is that we have these massive corpora of say newspaper articles, of social media, of all these things that people read on an everyday basis. And we have models that can learn and represent information from those corpora. And so we can take a learning mechanism, right? We can take some sort of cognitive mechanisms about how people, how we think people are learning from, from text or learning from language. And we can embed that model within that realistic language environment. And we can see how that model learns. We can see how it performs on various tasks. And we can see how it maps onto the behavior of people at different time points. Um, and so we are constructing these sort of virtual environments to train our models in that are, you know, compared to what my son is going through, much, much limit, extremely limited. But we're starting to sort of get at that point where we can be sort of confident that what we're given to our models is somewhat akin to what, what a, uh, a human being might actually uh, experience. Um, and so this provides cognitive scientists uh, an additional tool by which we can start to really sort of figure out what do we need to build into a system to get it to explain data and what comes naturally or, or what comes free to us by virtue of just being a human being embedded in an environment, being in a body, interacting with others, you know, experience, uh, uh, getting experience from our, our, our physical environment. Right, our, our environment is extremely informative. It, it's relatively complex, but it's also redundant, right? We see the same things over and over again, typically. Uh, when you wake up in the morning, you get your cup of coffee, you, you read the newspaper, you go to work. Um, and so all of these things are informative and, and provide us with, with new knowledge by which, or, or new experiences that we can, can learn from. And so that, that's the, the basis of, of my research. So we have these models of cognition that are embedded in, in text, text and learn from text and, and can extract sophisticated information from that test, text um, with a corresponding uh, need for very large data set with which to evaluate these models. And so compared to previous sort of theories of cognition where we, we were sort of more limited in terms of how we could actually evaluate model performance. When we have a model that basically has been exposed to similar amounts of information as a human being has, we need very large data sets that sort of eclipse what we could do in a, in a sort of laboratory experiment. And so for the last 25-ish years, this has been a concerted effort both by computational people and by empiricists to collect very large data sets by which to evaluate these, these new models. Um, and so this is a little video of, 
a this this is just the standard model that that I use in my own research. Uh, my colleagues and I have been developing it for about 15 years now. Um, and so what you're going to see here is basically the model's brain. This is its sort of neural code that it that it's building um, through exposure to text. In this case, it's learning from uh, uh, textbooks from grade one through 12. And what you're going to see here is how these these words cluster together in space. So like how similar they are to each other. And then here you'll just see the graph of how similar these clusters are. So I'll just start this here. And so what you can see is that the neural code that the model has is, is initially random, right? It hasn't actually accumulated enough information to have a, a, a similarity among these things. But what you can see from this bottom graph is that as it's being exposed to more and more language, the model is starting to get more similar. The neural code is starting to synchronize for these words that, that are have similar meanings, right? So we have countries and colors and fish. And you can see that they starting they are starting to cluster together in, in, in semantic space. Uh, and so this demonstrates that what we are experiencing through the environment is enough for us to discriminate these different categories, right? So we can discriminate colors from countries and countries from fish. Uh, and so this is suggesting that going back to this idea of sort of innate knowledge, that that, that may not necessarily be, be a requirement in, in these systems because we get that information for free, right? As we experience more language and as we experience more things in our, our world, like we experience fish and we experience colors, it becomes obvious to us that these things have different categories or these things have different sort of functions and different, different primary features. And, and that emerges naturally through, through the types of experience that we might have with the world. And so the, the field that I operate in is entitled computational cognitive science. Um, and traditionally what we are interested in is quantifying or, or generating mechanisms about uh, how our brains are operating essentially, and how those mechanisms are related to the behaviors that we have. Uh, and the environment has always been considered important, but we've sort of lacked the tools by which we can actually start to quantify and understand how the environment influences our mechanisms. Um, and so what these approaches have done, what these sort of big data machine learning approaches have done, is provide us with an ability to generate an understanding of the connections between the input to a model um, and how that relates to, to the information processing that's going on in our brain. And so it might be the case that a lot of the mechanisms that we proposed in the past are you know, overly complicated because the information processing that needs to be done is directly given to us from the environment. And so we can propose relatively simple learning mechanisms um, uh, that can acquire that information that provides us with the necessary complexity to actually ac account for these different types of behaviors. Um, and so as a psychologist, we are always, it is always necessary to collect data to, to evaluate our models. Um, and so traditionally in, in psychology, we, we run relatively small numbers of subjects, say, between 50 and 500. Um, but recently what's been happening and in relation to, to the development of these types of models is that people have been running or, or other researchers, myself included, have been running very large studies that look to uh, collect data from a thousand to hundreds of thousands of individuals so that we can get a good understanding of what the population of, of, of people look like. Um, and so a lot of this, Research came about from uh, a project called the English Lexicon Project uh, from Dave Bolota at Washington, who ran sort of standard uh, psycholinguistic tasks uh, across a, a fairly large number of people, but it really showed people that it was a, an extremely useful type of data to collect. Uh, and so this has been extended to other languages. So like basically any language that psychologist studies now have had this similar project uh, run on them. And, and I, I edit a methods journal and my main editing job is just 
going through all of the various big data projects that are being run in, in psychology these days. And there are an immense amount of them. And for most of them to be useful, require these types of models that can really sort of scale up to this, this type of data. Um, but this provides a very different approach to the development of theory of cognition. Uh, traditionally in psychology, we use what's called the hypothetical deductive approach, which is that you propose a hypothesis or, or a theory about how something is working. Uh, you collect some data that, that is designed to evaluate the sort of um, ability of that theory to account for that data. If the theory uh, accounts for it, then you move on to your next experiment. If it doesn't account for it, then you reject your theory and modify it as necessary to, to account for the data. And so you have this sort of circular uh, logic where you are continually collecting data, data and modifying your theory in response to it. In this sort of these, these new approaches, uh, we use something called abductive reasoning. So instead of starting from a theory and collecting data based on that theory, what we're doing is starting from data, right? We're starting from these very large data sets um, uh, of human behavior. And we are starting and we try to infer the types of mechanisms that could be used to actually produce that behavior, right? And so uh, let's say you're interested in social media. There's lots of variants and, and lots of interesting human behavior on social media. Uh, if you want to have an account of how, why, or how and why people are behaving on social media, you need to start from this sort of analysis of communication patterns or whatever on, on, on Reddit or, or Twitter. And so your theory is starting to emerge from your data rather, from that, rather than your data starting to emerge from your theory. And so this is um, a, a, not a standard approach in psychology, but I think it's one that can be very complementary to um, to, to, to standard approaches that, that people have developed through, through the history of psychology. Um, so that's my spiel. So I think, I think like, like most sciences, psychology um, is going to be heavily impacted by machine learning. Uh, it already has been in, in many areas such as, as data analysis, um, but in terms of even cognitive theory and developing you know, our ideas about how people are, or why people are behaving such as they do. I think there are lots of fruitful avenues out there that, that is going to, um, that are going to open up in, in response to this. But I do think it, it is a very different approach than, than has typically been taken in our science. And I, I think it is something that we need to be a little bit conservative about in, in terms of, um, you know, just, just being full flung and diving head first into it, we still need to be sort of grounded in the typical methodologies and, and understandings that, that psychologists have, have developed over you know, the last 70 years or so. All right, I'm out of time. Thank you. Okay, I guess uh, it's up to me now. Um, thanks everyone for the invitation. Mathieu, Anu, Chloe, thank you very much for this. Uh, Brendan, you would definitely get an A in my class. In fact, uh, I think I might have to twist your arm to give some guest lectures next time I teach philosophy of mind. Um, so that was a very philosophical talk uh, and a wonderful introduction to some things I'm going to talk about. Uh, let me just share my screen. Okay. So my title in a way is a, is a little puzzling um, in the sense that uh, it's not really clear what philosophy is doing um, in uh, a mini science theory, series to do with, with the mind, uh, with neuroscience and the mind. Uh, I mean, after all, we don't have a philosophy of uh, the kidney. We don't have a philosophy of the spleen. Uh, why do we have a philosophy of, of, of the brain? Well, I think the answer is not going to be terribly surprising. Uh, we now believe that the mind is somehow identical to the brain or identical to what the brain does. And so as uh, the great visual physiologist Semir Zeki put it, uh, the problems that philosophers have always been wondering about are now also the problems that neuroscientists are wondering about. 
And if philosophers really want to be able to understand how the mind works, uh, then we, while we don't have to become neuroscientists, we probably have to learn something about the brain and where the brain and its functions fits into our understanding of the mind and its functions. Now, uh, philosophers have actually been interested in two really broad sets of questions when it comes to the brain. And um, I thought I'd do a bit of a, uh, a once over lightly, rather than talk about my own work, just give you a bit of a feel for this field, which will undoubtedly be unusual to most of you, because it, it is a pretty, a pretty specialized field. One set of questions that philosophers are interested in is really part of a much larger investigation of philosophers interested in science. Okay, so as you all know, uh, philosophy once did what we now call science, and eventually science became its own thing. Um, but even from the time that science became an independent study, philosophers have been ex exceptionally interested in science, both because science has been asking similar questions to some philosophical questions, and also because science is telling us about the universe and philosophers want to understand the universe. So there is a field uh, that we usually call philosophy of neuroscience, which is kind of parallel to fields that already existed, namely philosophy of physics, philosophy of biology, philosophy of psychology, and so on. Uh, the second and, and more familiar uh, field of interest for philosophers involves looking at the results of neuroscience in an effort to see how they might affect our own research. Uh, so not looking at the science, but trying to learn from the science uh, about questions that are still philosophical. And this field's usually called neurophilosophy, a name that was invented uh, when, in a way, the field was created by one of my heroes, uh, Patricia Churchland, a Canadian philosopher who worked uh, for most of her career at San Diego. In 1986, she wrote this book, Neurophilosophy, which sort of inaugurated, inaugurated the field. So what I thought I would do then is is give you an overview of the philosophy of neuroscience, give you some feel just for the kinds of questions and topics that philosophers are interested in, and then spend a few minutes talking about the neurophilosophy. And here, what I thought I'd do is take a, an illustration, an interesting illustration, rather than give you a survey, uh, just so you get a bit of a feel of the crosstalk between neuroscience and philosophy. So let me start with the philosophy of neuroscience. Sciences typically have as part of their conceptual framework, a number of fundamental concepts. The kind of things that uh, intro to the field courses teach uh, that every first year student learns about. And some of these uh, turn out to be quite complicated, even though they first appear to be simple and basic and philosophers have taken an interest in these. So let me give you an illustration uh, of one, the receptive field. So the receptive field is a way of classifying sensory neurons, neurons that are devoted to perception, visual perception, auditory perception, and so on. And first and foremost, the receptive field of a neuron refers to the part of space that the neuron's interested in. So neurons will only get active if something is happening in a particular region of space, if they're sensory neurons. And secondarily, those neurons will only get activated if something in particular is happening in that part of space. And that something in particular is also part of what we think of as, it, of it, as its receptive field. So for example, there are neurons that will get uh, activated if there's a bit of red in the part of space that it's interested in, but it'll be completely silent if there's only green in that part of space. So we'll say that the receptive field of that neuron is a receptive field sensitive to the color red. Now, it turns out that the receptive field as a concept has evolved over the decades uh, from the time that visual, modern visual neurophysiology was, was founded, not exclusively, but to a very large extent by our own David Hubel. David Hubel is a McGill graduate and Torsten Wiesel, uh, who made a lot of uh, understanding how receptive fields work. And over the decades, uh, the notion of the receptive fields has become more complicated. It's now, receptive fields now often are a little bit uh, less stable than we used to think they were. And they have interesting connections to the relationship that Brendan referred to, namely the relationship between the organism and the environment. And that's a question that philosophers uh, have written about. A second general areas, what you might call fundamental principles. So again, sciences are typically made up 
uh, of foundational ideas, basic commitments about how their how uh, their part of the universe works, and these are often conceptually very rich. So let me give you uh, another example, a very fundamental one. It's the principle of functional localization, and this is a very old principle. It's the idea that different functions of the brain are located in different regions of the brain, and that. Would, surprisingly turns out to have been controversial at different times in the history of neuroscience. The principle is actually really old. It was first uh, proposed by the phrenologists, most famously Franz Josef Gall. And these are the people, famously, who thought that you could tell the personality of an individual by feeling the bumps on their, on their skulls. Uh, and the idea was that the brain had different regions devoted to, among other things, personality traits. And if you were particularly strong in this personality trait, it would make that bit of your brain larger and that would press up against your skull and make a bump. So if Ian was particularly courageous, you would feel a bump in the courage area. Now, this science, if you look it up, right? Well, you'll always get told this is a jejun science. It's simplistic. It's really a pseudoscience. And all of that's true. Uh, you, you won't know whether I'm courageous or not by palpating my skull. But uh, the phrenologist did make this fundamental contribution in the idea that different parts of your mental capacity are located in different brain regions. And it's an idea that was sort of lost and then recovered. Uh, uh, it took a hundred years from Gaul until this principle came to be recognized as clearly true, most famously in some work by a bunch of neurologists, here are two of the most famous ones. Paul Broca discovered uh, that there were people who had particular kind of brain damage that prevented them from speaking, but they seemed able to understand language. If you could get them to communicate non-verbally, uh, it, it appeared that they could understand language. And about 10 years later, Carl Wernicke found that there was a region of the brain that when damaged seemed to prevent people from understanding language, but they could speak. So they could babble incoherently. They could produce the motor behavior associated with language, but not the meanings of language. And so they discovered not only that language is located in a particular part of the brain, but actually the sub-functions of language are themselves located in different parts of the brain uh, at some distance. So that's the principle of functional localization. A third topic has to do with methods that Brendan also um, mentioned. The most famous of these, of course, the one that most people know and that's used all over cognitive neuroscience is brain imaging, uh, particularly functional magnetic resonance imaging. Um, and this is a way of looking at the brain as it's doing things and seeing which parts of the brain are active by uh, looking at blood flow to the brain and making some assumptions about the relationship between blood flow and actual brain activity. Um, now, let me give you an example of why this is controversial by telling you something that's only for this audience. If anybody repeats this, I will deny it, especially if you repeat it to any neuroscientists you know. Uh, some philosophers, and I include myself among them, think that brain imaging tells us much less about how the mind works than lots of neuroscientists think. Brain imaging can tell us an awful lot about how the brain works, but I'm a bit skeptical about how much brain imaging can tell us about mental function. And there was a debate that was popular some time ago when brain imaging methods were a little bit less sophisticated than they are now, uh, that was very, very active around this question. Just to show you that it's not completely crazy that philosophers are dubious, I'll, I'll just show you something just en passant from the sort of front lines of of cognitive neuroscience. Here's, here's the front page of a paper that was just published last week in Nature. So you know that it's a serious paper. And what the brain, what the paper shows is that a whole swath of brain imaging studies uh, may be unreliable because most brain imaging studies typically uh, look at say 20 or 25 people. And this group showed that you only get reliable results when you study thousands of people. And uh, if these folks are right, of course, this, is, this paper is all of a week old, but if these folks are right, then an awful lot of work, some of which I'm committed to personally, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not rejoicing in this by any means, some of the work, uh, particularly that psychiatrists are doing, um, may be quite unreliable. So if anybody in the audience has a brain imager among their friends or family, be, be nice to them. They've had, a, they've had a very bad week. Finally, um, 
some fundamental questions. Every science in some sense has either in the forefront, uh, f- foreground or in the background, some basic questions that they're aspiring to answer. And I think in the case of neuroscience, there's little doubt that the, the big question that neuroscience wants to answer that of course philosophers also want to answer uh, is the question of consciousness. I think it's arguable that consciousness might be the, the biggest scientific question there is or among them. Uh, and it's, it's definitely the hardest one. When I was an undergraduate, um, if you were interested in consciousness, then you probably didn't wear shoes and you probably smoked clove, clove cigarettes. I'll tell Anouk um, and, and Chloe what those are. They probably don't exist anymore. Um, but by the time I was a graduate student, consciousness research was respectable again. And um, not just uh, in philosophy, but, but in neuroscience. And I, I'd say now that uh, looking at the neural correlates of consciousness is one of the most exciting interdisciplinary and sophisticated parts of neuroscience. It's a really exciting area. I think we, we, don't, we still don't have any clue about consciousness, um, but we're learning an awful lot about the brain and the mind by studying it. This is also a really interesting area because I think this is one area where philosophers are not just listening to neuroscientists, but they're also speaking to neuroscientists because philosophers thought about consciousness quite a long time before it was a topic in neuroscience and discovered that consciousness presents some very special conceptual problems. And those are problems that I think it's fair to say are influencing the way cognitive neuroscientists are organizing their own research and their problems that are very much Uh, in the forefront of uh, neuroscientific research into the topic. Okay, so, so much for um, a little little surf over philosophy of neuroscience. Let me turn to uh, the second uh, domain of questions, um, neurophilosophy. And I'm gonna focus here on one particular illustration. That's the the nature of the self. And I, I focused on the nature of the self for a couple of reasons. First, because of course it's a, it's a topic that philosophers are really interested in. It's also a topic that everybody's interested in. We all want to know what makes an individual who they are, what makes a person a person. Uh, and so this is a topic where philosophy is trying to illuminate something of real human importance. But it's also a topic where some very fundamental findings in neuroscience have really influenced how we think about this topic. Uh, they're, they're fundamental and they're very early findings in cognitive neuroscience that have really stood the test of time. So things that you can really, really take seriously. And this, these findings have to do with what is known as the split brain. Hmm. Now, the brain, as you know, is made up of two, two lobes, two hemispheres that, are, that look sort of like mirror images. They don't really do uh, entirely the same thing as each other, but they're, they're uh, physically uh, symmetric. Uh, and the, they're held together by a bundle of nerve fibers, uh, a bunch of them, including uh, perhaps the most important one, which is known as the corpus callosum. And in the 1940s, surgeons began to experiment with a surgical procedure that involved cutting the corpus callosum, severing the fibers, as a way of de- dealing with intractable epilepsy. So epilepsy, as you know, is, a, is an abnormal electrical activity in the brain and it sometimes spreads uncontrollably. And when nothing else works, one way to keep the electrical storm from moving from one hemisphere to another is to literally cut the bridge uh, that will allow the storm to move. And so people with very severe epilepsy underwent this operation. And about 20 years after this started happening, uh, a psychologist called Roger Sperry and his graduate student, Michael Gazaniga, began to ask the question, what happens to animals or human beings who undergo uh, this split brain operation? Um, Now, if you ever meet someone who's had this operation, it's still done, uh, you would never know that there's anything different about them. But in the lab, uh, using very clever arrangements that Sperry and Gazaniga developed, you can do something really remarkable. Because the right and left hemispheres don't talk to one another in these patients, you can very carefully introduce information into one hemisphere at a time. And so you can, in effect, have a conversation between one hemisphere at a time. And you can show, for example, the right hemisphere a triangle and the left hemisphere a circle. And depending on uh, what each hemisphere has seen, you can either get the person to reply in language, language is in the left hemisphere and right-handed people, 
or you can get them to pick up something that the right hemisphere has seen and so on. Now, if you do this very cleverly, you can actually generate conflicts. So you can show the right hemisphere, say a chicken and the left hemisphere a shovel. And then you can ask the, the person in the experiment to pick up a picture of what they saw. And what you find is under some circumstances, you get a kind of a conflict. The right arm driven by the left hemisphere and the left arm driven by the right hemisphere start doing different things. And what you seem to have therefore is something like maybe two different agents in the same body. And so it's very hard to avoid the question, how many cells are there in the head of a split brain patient? But more importantly, how many cells are there in our heads? Because the split brain experiment, split brain surgery simply separates the hemispheres. Everybody has two hemispheres. And so if there is more than one self in the split brain patient, there's very likely more than one self in each of us. And that's naturally a question that philosophers can't resist. And indeed, in 1971, another one of my heroes, Tom Nagel, philosopher at NYU, still working, uh, wrote a paper uh, where he addressed exactly this question. He considered the early split brain results, and he asked the question, how many selves are there? And what he does in that paper is he considers a bunch of possibilities. Uh, so the first possibility is that there really is only one self. It's in the left hemisphere. That's the hemisphere that typically can speak. And the right hemisphere does something, but it's kind of not really a full person. That's one option. Second option is that there's one self in the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere is like a self or self has stuff that's self-like, but it's not integrated into uh, the overarching personhood of the, of the patient. Third possibility is that there are two cells, one that speaks and one that can't. There's one unintegrated self that somehow draws information from both hemispheres in a slightly awkward way. And that finally, maybe there's only one self, but somehow the experiment, the conditions of the experiment themselves create two selves, which then vanish when the experiment's over. Now, I don't have time to take you through uh, Nagel's arguments, but what he does in effect is he shows that none of these options is really satisfactory. And what he concludes in a sort of typically philosophical way is that the problem was the question. Uh, the question presumes that there is an answer. There is a whole number that is the answer to the question, how many selves are we? And what Nagel argues in effect is that there is no such thing as the self. What we have are a range of different mental functions, which in healthy, uh, well-functioning people are sufficiently integrated to, as it were, give the impression of a unity to other people. And similarly, other people who are well-integrated give the impression of a unity to us. But that really is kind of an illusion. And so the bottom line for Nagel, as it is for other philosophers for other reasons, is that the self is really kind of vanishing. Now, one of the interesting things that this view raises, if it's true, is could we do without the idea of a self? So let's suppose it's true that there is no self. The notion of the self is pretty important in the way we think about ourselves and our culture. For example, if uh, I do something wrong, if I steal something, I go before a judge, the judge is gonna say, you, Mr. Gold did something wrong, and so you must be punished. It's not going to do me much good to say, sorry, uh, there is no me. There's just a bunch of integrated functions in my brain. That won't wash. So the notion of selfhood is at the center of our concepts of agency, responsibility, reward, punishment, legal and moral, and so on. And so if the self is truly uh, an illusion, then the question arises whether we can do without it and what it would look like if we tried. And that, of course, is a question for philosophers, uh, if anything is. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Professor Gold, Professor Johns. Those were wonderful talks. So um, our first question is for Professor
uh, Gold, uh, could neuroscience contribute in other ways to the investigation of the self? Uh, undoubtedly, uh, it already has. I've already mentioned something implicitly that's relevant, which is the idea of a bunch of integrated capacities. So another very famous philosopher, Daniel Dennett, has argued that you don't need to appeal to anything as recherche as split brain experiments to argue that there's no self. What is the self, Dennett says? It's the place where all the information comes and all the decisions are made. Now go and ask a neuroscientist where that place is in the brain. And what you'll be told is there is no such place. And so the self really is uh, an illusion uh, all there is are the integrated functions of the brain, which create the appearance of, of unity. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Our next question is for Professor John. So uh, we were wondering what are some advantages and disadvantages of using big data and machine learning in cognitive science? So I think, yeah. Uh, in my talk, I sort of went through the advantages. I think being able to understand the sort of information sources that people are, are exposed to uh, on a very large scale is, is um, a really important trend and, and will advance cognitive theory quite, quite a bit uh, in the coming years. I think the disadvantages is that nobody is trained to use these kind of things. And so um, I, I've done a little bit of this in, in my own research, but people will publish using these models that come from computer science and computer science has much different motivations than psychology and philosophy and, and all of these fields that are sort of integrated in studying the mind. They don't necessarily care about cognitive mechanism or anything like that. Um, and so psychologists will sort of embrace these models. And when you start to really dig into what the models are actually doing, you, you quickly start to realize that they're that's not how people can do stuff, right? It's just, it's a very different architecture to whatever could be uh, implemented in the brain. And so I think there's a lot of, I mean, it's, it's gonna take years to have a, a shift towards people where people are sort of fluent um, in their ability to, to actually sort of think critically like we are sort of trained to do about, about everything else in our um, sort of day-to-day -day life about these kind of algorithms because people just don't have that background. But I will say the development of um, computer programming languages like Python, which is widely available, is much easier than, than uh, previous, like C or Java or whatever. And so that's definitely made it more accessible to, to, to students. And, and like the students that I see and kind of come through my lab are so much better prepared than, than I was even. Um, and so I think, I think it's, it's uh, it's very promising in terms of the types of education that many students are getting these days. Thank you, thank you so much. Another question for Dr. Gold. Um, so you talked about uh, Thomas Nag Nagel's different uh, conceptions of the self. Uh, so do most philosophers agree with Thomas Nagel about the non-existence of the self? There is a very big group of philosophers who do agree with him, though probably not for the reasons he gives. Um, it's interesting that the idea that the self is an illusion is actually quite an old idea. It's a very old idea in some parts of Indian philosophy. Uh, and those of you interested in Buddhism will have heard the no self view. Um, there's actually some pretty sophisticated philosophy behind it that comes much earlier in the Eastern tradition, in the Indian tradition than it does in the West. But in the West, uh, the philosopher David Hume, who's a philosopher who lived some centuries ago, had already advocated the view that the self is an illusion. And without going into too much detail, his argument is roughly this. Uh, look in your, into your own mind, he says, and try to find yourself, right? See if you can notice yourself thinking or notice yourself doing something. What you find is you don't notice yourself, you notice a thought or a sensation or a feeling or an emotion or something. What you notice are the contents of your thoughts and the, the self, the person is a kind of a construct, is the thing that's supposed to be the container for all of these things. 
But in fact, there's no evidence, Hume says, that the container exists, only the things that are contained in it. And so he has a view that says the self, if it exists at all, is a bundle. It's just a bundle of, of mental states. And really what he thinks is that there is no such thing as the self. And as a result, we really do change over time as we lose some memories and we gain some new ones and have you know, old experiences and new ones take their place. Uh, we're changing. We're, we're, we're not utterly different from day to day as long as we don't have mental or, or neurological illness, but we are genuinely changing. And so the self is really a fluid thing in some sense, a thing that doesn't really exist at all. Interesting. So um, my colleagues and I, this is a long ranging project, but there's this notion of decentralized cognition that emerged in the sort of seventies in response to what are called prototype models of categorization. Um, and so there's a, a notion of language that there isn't any sort of centralized storage of words or sent sentences or whatever that a typical model might propose. Like dog isn't this, this thing that you have stored, but dog, when you need to use it, is retrieved from whatever you're experiencing at the time. Um, so that's, that's, yeah, I have I don't know about <laughs> philosophy of self, but I mean, in, in psychology, we've explored types of theories like that. I think it's, uh, I mean, I think it's sort of at, it has to kind of kind of be right, right? Because it's it, nothing is the same. It's all depending on what how you want to use it. I, I think that's absolutely right. Actually, I think that those are the kinds of data. I mean, whether they're those particular data trying to be right or wrong doesn't matter. As as you say, Brendan, it's it's the general view of how the mind and brain work. It's just much fuzzier and more fluid and decentralized and kind of responsive to a particular situation. Uh, to have anything like this kind of yeah. permanent, unchanging entity, which is you, you know? Yeah, I yeah, completely agree with that. So our next question was for uh, Professor Johnson. Uh, so we were wondering how can we make an infer um, inferences about the mind from big data and machine learning? Yeah, I, I think it's, I think it's hard. So I was, I was talking about abductive reasoning, right? And so um, in the sort of big data collection, people have general research ideas about what they, they want to explore based upon you know, the, the past history of the field. So we have all these tasks that we've run on, on small sample sizes. And so a, a big trend is that we're gonna take those tasks, but we're gonna run it on 10,000 people or whatever and get, get a ton of data and get a pop, pop, sort of population size, size kind of Kind of example of, of how people perform on this task with us, as many stimuli as you possibly can. And so the idea of adductive reasoning is that we start to generate these sort of models based upon that, that, that best accounts for all the variance in that data. Um, but, and so I've, I've talked to philosophers of science about this and some have very radical ideas about how that should operate. In my own mind, I think we have to have some combination with traditional approaches, right? So we generate these theories from this, this sort of found data. And then we start to have targeted experimentation where we start to tease apart really what, what's happening in these, these certain situations. So we can have this sort of interactive process between big data and then, then targeted experimentation. Um, the reproducibility stuff that Ian talked about um, throws a lot of Reproducibility in behavioral sciences has been a massive topic of conversation and across across psychology. Um, this fMRI stuff is really um, important and it's going to uh, bring a lot of questions about how we can infer, you know, relationships between brain brain and behavior from from that that type. But yeah, so I, I generally think I think I think psychology, even though it's considered like this sort of young science, actually has very from a philosophy of science perspective, it's a very rigid sort of theory construction process. And so I, I don't think we can throw out that, but I think this sort of adds an additional tool by which we can, we can start to integrate different types of, of theorization. Let's say a word about that actually is absolutely right. So David Hume, who I just mentioned is one of the three grandfathers of modern psychology, Locke, Berkeley, John Locke, yeah. Berkeley and David Hume. So Brendan's right that there's a quite sophisticated kind of 
uh, conceptual foundations that psychology grew out of. I'll also say, I was actually really delighted to hear uh, that uh, ab abductive inference is kind of a, a, a primary tool here, because I think this is another place where there's kind of, you know, growing consensus. Um, lots of philosophers of science have been talking about the importance of abductive reasoning, you know, for a long time, and I think have been skeptical uh, about the, you know, hypothesis testing method uh, as as the kind of thing that, you know, however it works, however well it works as an idealization, probably not not a, not the best way always to work in the lab. So it's really cool that uh, that that this method's actually. Um, getting a workout in your lab. Yes, I mean, the only reason I know about it is because I gave a talk at a symposium somewhere and, and a philosopher of science came up and said, this is, this is what you're doing. <laughs> We've talked about this for, for 40 years now. And so I was like, oh, we're, yeah, we're not I wanna, we're, I we, have, we, we have something that we can contribute. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a fun, fun symposium. Um, okay, so thank you, uh, Dr. Johns and Dr. Gold, for these uh, two uh, very interesting presentations and very interesting uh, discussion. Uh, so I would now like to thank the speakers uh, officially with uh, a gift. Uh, although, uh, Ian, I don't know if you remember, but you know that I'm a brain imager, right? So <laughs> I know, uh, and I and my heart <laughs> went out to you when I saw the paper. <laughs> yeah, yeah we, we, we can we can talk about it, but. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure you'll get your gift, so. <laughs> all right. It's only because uh, we're friends that I knew I could say it. <laughs> uh, all right, so you're uh, going to receive a postcard from the Red Path Museum. So this is your first gift. Uh, it's a very special postcard. It's uh, stereoscopic. And when you open it up and look through it, uh, you get to see this dinosaur in 3D. Uh, so the, the Red Path Museum is Canada's uh, oldest museum. It is located at McGill. It was opened in 1882 and it used to be open to the public, but unfortunately it's uh, currently closed. Uh, but uh, they are still uh, working uh, and we are also sending you some of the museum's uh, publications, which are uh, still accessible at the gift shop. So even though you don't have access to the museum, you have access to the museum's exhibit through the book. Uh, for so, for instance, here you, um, you can all learn about the, the minerals that are in the museum's uh, mineral gallery. Uh, last part of your uh, gift, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, a mask. We hope that uh, we won't be needing those for um, for a long time now, but uh, you'll have uh, another one to add to your uh, collection. Uh, and finally, uh, the Red Path is also running a fund uh, raising campaign. So the outreach team is currently building uh, discovery boxes where uh, instead of schools coming to the museum, they can send these boxes uh, in, in the schools and in remote communities and in uh, underserved communities. Uh, and we would really like to have these uh, boxes full of amazing things like minerals, fossils, skeletons, uh, bones, uh, so this uh, campaign is running as part of uh, McGill 24 crowdfunding, and it ends on May uh, 12. So uh, all uh, donations are uh, welcome. Uh, so we'll uh, see you next, next week, uh, next Wednesday, uh, for a, another presentation by uh, Drs. Uh, uh, Anna Weinberg and Cecilia uh, Flores on the uh, adolescent uh, brain. Um, so I would like to thank the, the speakers uh, again, and thank you for uh, coming in tonight. Bye-bye. Have you. a good evening. Bye.